So we just talked about the first time homebuyer tax credit of $15,000, which is essentially going to be accessed immediately rather than kind of retroactively in the form of a tax credit. It can be used as a down payment. So let's talk about the impact on that on home builders. So if, if you look at the impact it would have on home builders and developers who have struggled in many ways to keep supply in line with demand, you know, on one hand, they'll benefit from the buyers that, that want to build their first home since they're incentivized to do so with the proposed tax credit. But on the other hand, there are a myriad of issues that builders and developers have to deal with right now. Everything from, you know, very high regulatory costs, which are, are mostly environmental in nature and enforced on the local and state level. Of course, you've got the shortage of labor due to immigration policies. You've got, uh, you know, the tariff trade wars that have increased the cost of materials due to a shortage of supply. I mean, builders are looking at uh, certain materials, woods, metals that go into a home that, as being two to four times more expensive than they were pre-pandemic. Uh, we're looking at massive delays on those materials, which of course increases holding costs. We look at acquisition prices for land because a rising tide lift all's bo- lifts all boats. And so land is just more expensive to purchase and develop. And then you've got the competing priorities of adding supply to the market while also attempting to decrease the environmental impact, which is a big part of the Biden platform. So if you look at his plan, and again, if you go to JoeBiden.com slash housing, he wants to establish a $100 billion affordable housing fund to construct and upgrade affordable housing. $65 billion of that is going to go into new incentives for state housing authorities and the Indian Housing Block Grant Program to construct or rehab low-cost, efficient, resilient, and accessible housing in areas where affordable housing is in short supply, Charleston being one of them. These funds will be directly uh, allocated toward communities that are suffering from an affordability crisis and that are willing to implement new zoning laws that encourage more affordable housing. $10 billion of it is going to make homes more efficient. $5 billion is going to increase the stock of affordable housing as part of a larger community development effort, specifically Uh, Those funds are going to go into uh, things like the home program, which ensures that the program's requirements are more conducive for supporting first-time home buyers, and the capital magnet fund, which uh, spurs private investment uh, in affordable housing and economic development in in distressed communities. Uh, He's also going to increase funding for the housing trust fund by $20 billion. Uh, He's going to increase the availability of affordable housing through that fund paid for by an increase in the assessment of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And we're going to talk about that in just a minute. You know, these additional dollars are going to support the construction and rehab of those affordable housing units. He's going to provide tax incentives for the construction of more affordable housing. Um, He's going to give a $10 billion investment uh, in in that arena to the low-income housing tax credit, which is a tax provision uh, uh, that's, that's designed to incentivize the construction of uh, affordable housing. So there are all these things that he's going to do, but he also wants to um, ensure that minority owned businesses benefit from investing in housing instruction and repair. He wants to eliminate local and state regulations that limit affordable housing options uh, and that contribute to urban sprawl. In fact, if you look on his website, there's so much of it that ties urban sprawl and um, non condensed construction of inventory toward climate change. The environmental impact of all of this is a very big cornerstone of the Biden campaign, uh, if you didn't know that already. And so uh, for all these new housing investments, I mean, those receiving assistance um, will be required to abide by something called the Davis and Bacon or the the Davis Bacon Act, um, which has wage requirements so that jobs created with these investments support uh, family sustaining wages and benefits and the Biden administration will encourage uh, the use of of resources and materials that are sourced domestically, as well as the use of project labor agreements. And so we've got all these interesting things that are going to be hit on the uh, builder side of of the ledger, uh, including incentives for multifamily construction, but at the same time, making sure that his administration isn't blamed, frankly, for the environmental impact of that development. Don't get me wrong. He wants to add supply to the market. He's he's geared a lot of his campaign and his uh, tactics toward low to middle income families and affordable housing. 
Um, but the fact of the matter is, builders are really struggling right now to keep up with demand. It's just, the lag time associated with everything I just mentioned uh, just doesn't allow them to gain any ground. And so then we talk, then we kind of shift the conversation and, and Biden's plan toward uh, lending practices and FHA taking a larger role in the lending process. Remember what we were talking about in the first segment about a buyer getting a $15,000 first time home buyer tax credit, or really anybody that hasn't owned a home in the past three years of $15,000. And if you look, I mean, right now, a lot of buyers are putting the bare minimum down for a down payment because of the cost of borrow money. It's just historically low. It's incredibly low. They'd rather keep their cash on hand uh, and, and either put that cash in a you know, reserve fund or to reinvest at a better you know, post-tax rate than what they would be paying in the form of interest on their mortgages. So Biden's administration uh, is going to try and get these big banks uh, back into the practice of participating in FHA loans. And because of the profitability of the program, which is far higher than they anticipated, it opens the door to allow them to cut prices on things like mortgage insurance premiums and the added cost associated with FHA mortgages. When you get an FHA mortgage, you have a one-time premium and then you have ongoing mortgage insurance, which is essentially the government's way of passing the buck to you, the borrower, due to the risk associated with a low down payment loan. And if you didn't know, the big banks, you know, they basically exited FHA lending almost entirely uh, after the Great Recession because of the enforcement actions that came against them uh, for how they managed that program, predatory lending and, and, you know, everything in between. And they were hit with uh, massive lawsuits and actions under the False Claims Act, which resulted in, in very expensive settlements. So now you have all these independent mortgage bankers that have stepped in and now not only dominate the FHA space, uh, but they account for the more majority of, of mortgage lending. So big banks could not only help to kind of broaden the availability of more affordable housing, you know, thanks to their ample capital. Uh, but they're also bound by something called the community reinvestment act, which by the way, non banks are not bound to. And essentially what it says is that banks have a statutory obligation to commit to reinvest funds from communities that they take deposits from. So Biden wants to strengthen the community reinvestment act and make it apply to non-bank, non-bank lenders as well. So again, we're, we're increasing cost. We're, we're trying to get big banks into FHA lending, but we're increasing costs. We're mandating that anybody that uh, lends money uh, have a portion of those proceeds go toward the Community Reinvestment Act. And guess who's going to foot the bill for that? You, the consumer. Now, there's another big part of the Biden um, rollout on, on housing that uh, hasn't necessarily, I would say, impacted our market locally as much as it has something like California. But as it specifically relates to tenants and landlords, you know, one of the first things that he wants to do, you know, before we kind of get into the tenant-landlord relationship and uh, paying rent and moratoriums on foreclosures and evictions and um, you know, just everything that happens as a result of that, he wants to first and foremost uh, level the playing field. He wants to end redlining and other discriminatory and unfair practices uh, in the housing market. So he wants to protect homeowners and renters from abusive lenders and, and landlords through uh, what we call a uh, renter bill of rights, which it was modeled after uh, the California homeowner bill of rights. Um, and it says on his website that he's going to enact legislation to end many shortcomings in the more court in the mortgage and rental markets. This new bill of rights will prevent mortgage brokers from leading borrowers into loans that cost more than are appropriate prevent mortgage servicers from advancing a foreclosure when the homeowner is in the process of receiving a loan modification. It's going to give homeowners a private right of action to seek financial redress from mortgage lenders and servicers that violate these protections. And it's going to give borrowers the right to a timely notification on the status of their loan modifications and to be able to appeal modification denials. So we, we've got a few things to unpackage here it essentially wants to protect tenants from eviction, right? Housing evictions have, have devastating consequences for families and often stem from the uh, relatively small shortfalls in, in rent. And so as a former um, 
landlord, as, as somebody that owns rental properties, I mean, I would say that right now my, my tenants are paying my rent and that's great. But you look across the country and you look at the massive amount of people that are not paying rent. And as a result, the homeowner, the landlord is saying, all right, well, what am I going to do? Am I going to foot the bill? No, they're, they're, they're talking to their banks and they're instituting a forbearance. They're saying, hey, I can't pay you because the tenant isn't paying me. And those forbearance options, you know, first they were six months and now they're 12 months. And now what he's talking about is extending uh, a moratorium on evictions and foreclosures all the way out to September of this year. In fact, uh, he calls it the American Rescue Plan, uh, which, you know, it, it came out last week and it includes a call for extending the national moratorium on evictions and foreclosures until September 30th. It also sets aside funds, by the way, uh, to provide legal assistance to households facing foreclosure or eviction. Or eviction. And so uh, he's also calling for a $30 billion uh, emergency fund for rental, energy, and water assistance for hard-hit households, plus another $5 billion uh, in emergency assistance to people experiencing or at risk of homelessness. There's actually a lot on his website, joebiden.com slash housing, about preventing uh, homelessness. And if you look at the percentage of Americans right now that are experiencing housing related insecurity, uh, it, it's close to 10%. It was up, uh, you know, 7.2% was where it was at about two months ago. But um, they're hoping that at least the Biden administration is hoping that that influx of cash uh, from this new plan could alleviate that that pinch that many homeowners and renters might be feeling. And even then, it's, it's only a stopgap measure. I mean, without emergency rental assistance, these renters uh, could still find themselves without housing uh, whenever the moratorium uh, does end up uh, finalizing for, for all the unpaid rent that they've had. It's not like it's a forgiveness of rent. It's the same thing as a forbearance when you talk to your lender and you say, hey, I can't pay you right now. Give me 12 months. And what they're saying, you know, the lender is saying, all right, well, in 12 months, all those payments are due. Now, I imagine they're going to create a workaround to that and they're just saying, hey, you know what, we're going to tack on those 12 months to the end of your loan, or we're going to prorate your mortgage based on those missed payments, accrued interest, so on and so forth. We're, we're kind of yet to be seen as to how they're going to handle that. Um, but as part of his plan, he's calling for an additional $1,400 payment to each household, which by the way, is on top of the $600 that we all got earlier in this month in the form of a, in the form of a direct deposit. Um, and it's an expansion of uh, issues surrounding uh, jobless benefits he wants there to be a $15 minimum wage. These things are going to increase construction costs. I mean, it's the, the ripple effect will not be felt in our market for quite some time. So uh, when we come back, I want to talk about uh, this in a little bit more detail. I want to talk about the financial assistance uh, that he's proposing, the impact on the housing market, not just from a tenant perspective, but from a landlord perspective, from an investor perspective. So stick around. Still a lot to unpackage here. On the Brian Beatty Real Estate Show as we talk about Biden taking his presidency and the impact that's going to have on the housing market. Now, again, if you want to reach out to me, you want to talk more about the real estate market and your plans to buy, sell, or invest in real estate, my private cell phone number is 843-400-8009. That's 843-400-8009. Or check us out online, listingsincharleston.com. That's listingsincharleston.com. And, of course, you can listen to uh, eight years' worth of content on a weekly basis from this show on YouTube, on our website, listingsincharleston.com, on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, all those great places. Uh, just search for the Brian Beatty Real Estate Show. Stick around, folks. We'll be right back. Find Brian Beatty online at listingsincharleston.com. The Brian Beatty Real Estate Show continues next on The Big Talker, 1250 WTMA.